So I thought I'd uh, take some time today in this uh, webinar to talk about some perspectives on practice that I find useful or that are going, uh, that are very much alive in my life at the moment. And I thought I'd just share them with you in the, sen in the hope that perhaps some of it might be useful. Uh, when we do something like this on the web that anybody can tune into, people may be tuning in and they've never even heard of mindfulness and other people may be tuning in who have been teaching mindfulness-based interventions of one kind or another for a very long time and everybody in between. Uh, so I guess I'll just start by uh, saying a few things about the way I see mindfulness and it's an, and it's an ongoing work in progress because uh, the more one cultivates mindfulness, the more one's view in some sense matures and deepens and, uh, and uh, expands in certain ways. For me, uh, to a first approximation, we could say that mindfulness is just awareness, pure awareness, uh, and therefore is accessible to all of us and is part of simply being human. But it's not, uh, you know, people often say, well, I'm aware. What's so special about awareness? I'm aware of driving down the street. I'm aware of, uh, you know, whatever it is, eating my dinner. But if you begin to look at it, maybe actually not that aware. Maybe we're more lost in thought and thinking we're aware. Yeah, I know that I'm walking or driving or eating or, you know, talking with somebody. But uh, maybe we're not fully present. And maybe our awareness is so shaped by our thoughts and emotions that we don't get a chance to really be uh, fully available to ourselves or to each other from one, moment, from one moment to the next. So the cultivation of mindfulness is really a way to cultivate access to an awareness that you don't have to get because it's available to us in our daily lives. But a lot of the time we get so carried away with uh, busyness or with uh, one agenda or another or with on autopilot that we kind of are aware of what we're doing but kind of not. And mindfulness is a way of in some sense bringing things into a greater focus so that you're really more embodied, more in touch with various aspects of what's unfolding. That's kind of important because um, with all of the different fa challenges and stress that we face in our lives, you could ask yourself, I mean, if I'm faced with some major decision or major conundrum in my life, here's a pop quiz. Do I want to have 40% of my marbles, 70% of my marbles, 90% of my marbles, or 100% of my marbles available to me when I have to act, when I have to make the decision? And the answer to the quiz is obvious. You want to have your full repertoire of uh, capacities available, but a lot of the time, if we're on autopilot, we don't. So mindfulness, as I define it operationally, is the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So I'll say that again, paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally, the awareness that arises when we engage in that kind of a way with reality, with experience. So you'll notice that it doesn't say what to pay attention to because basically we have the capacity to attend to anything and out of that to be aware of a whole range of different aspects of experience that often we're only aware of some of it and we don't even question what are we not aware of, what are we blind to. And so it's very powerful to begin to ask yourself, what am I missing in my life or in my moments? And how much of my kind of bl blasting through my moments to get the other better moments at the end of the day when I get to go home from work or uh, on the weekend or whatever, so we're on vacation, so that we tend to make for special moments when all is happening exactly according to plan and very much the way we want. And then the other moments are kind of in between or just on the way to moments. And part of this perspective on uh, life that we're calling mindfulness is saying that there are no on the way to moments. There are no in-between moments. 
your life is unfolding only now in this moment and no other moment. And if you miss it, you've missed the moment of your life. And if you're out to lunch metaphorically, then you're really out of touch with some of the essential aspects of life. And it's not just when the proverbial stuff hits the proverbial fan that it would be a good idea to have all of your capacities online. But uh, in all moments, we will see more, we will feel more, we will learn more, we will uh, be much clearer if we can carry this awareness around with us. And it turns out it's infinitely portable, but it requires um, cultivation. And that's what meditation practice is, is it's the intentional cultivation of access to our own capacity for awareness, for relationality, for being in touch. And that's always reciprocal. Uh, we're touched by the world. We're touched through the eyes, we're touched through the ears, we're touched through the nose. Uh, so it's not like we're just touching the world, but we're also receiving the world in some way through all of our senses and through our thoughts and emotions. So mindfulness, in a way, is the awareness that holds the entire play of life unfolding in the only moments it ever does, moment by moment by moment, this one. And when we orient in this way, then um, we begin to exercise that muscle. And the more we exercise it, the deeper and more profound um, the inhabiting of our moments becomes. Now, in order to do that, as pretty much everybody knows now, there's, uh, there are formal meditation practices that help enormously in this cultivation. And a lot of people, I think, take the attitude that, well, I don't really need to practice meditation. I'll just be more present in my life from moment to moment and uh, less judgmental and a little bit less emotionally reactive and so forth. And, um, you know, and I often say, well, lots of luck. Because while it's easy to say, it's not so easy to do. And in some sense, it does require us to be willing to drop in on ourselves and practice exercising, if you will, that muscle or just cultivating the landscape or the terrain of how it feels when you choose to stop and to not do anything, to cultivate what we often call non-doing, to cultivate what I sometimes call the domain of being. Like, here I am, and I don't need the next moment. I don't need anything else to happen. Can I be completely at home in this one? And since, of course, there's no separation between the body and life, the landscape of the body and the sensory field of the body is a very important uh, element of what I'm experiencing when I stop and when I drop in on myself. So that would include, for instance, um, anything coming in through the eyes, anything coming, now right now what's coming through the eyes is me on your screen in some way or other, so that's not that interesting, but that's what's happening. Uh, and through the ears, if I stop talking, maybe we'll hear certain ambient sounds from inside the room or from far away. And we don't have to go out and search for any sounds. We can just let sounds come to us. And if not, well, then there's something else that's equally beautiful and observable, and that's what we call silence. How comfortable can we be with silence? And the answer is usually not very. We want to fill the space. But silence has an enormous amount to teach us, to offer us, uh, if we can learn how to inhabit the stillness and the spaciousness of silent wakefulness. And you don't have to do anything in order to make this happen. It's just like part of your genetic inheritance. It's in your DNA. It's in all of our DNA to be still, to be, without filling up the world or experience or our heads with anything, just allowing things to be as they are. And we do call ourselves human beings, so there is like some kind of major emphasis on being in the way we think of ourselves, like we're human beings. But a lot of the time, the, as the cliché goes, 
we act more like human doings than like human beings. So this is the invitation to just stop and drop in. Now I've been doing this since I was about 22 years old. Uh, so that's a lot of years, approaching 50 years. And over the years, I've come to see th this not as a kind of exercise and a, a kind of an artificial thing that, okay, now it's time for me to meditate and get myself all together and close my eyes and feel my breath and be aware. And, and then a lot of the time when <clears throat> I am aware, I may be giving myself instructions to be aware because the mind has a life of its own and it doesn't want to be aware or it doesn't like the silence or the stillness. Uh, but what I'm talking about more, and as I've practiced over the years, is more like when we take our seat in this way, it's not an exercise to make something happen. It's, it's a love affair. It's nothing less than a love affair with, the, with life itself. And the recognition that we really are only alive in this moment. Can we inhabit just this one and be in the body with kind of open-hearted spaciousness in the mind, not fill it with thought, not try to suppress any thoughts that are here, but just let thoughts do what they do, let our emotions and moods do what they do, but not be caught by any of it. Just let it all unfold because we've created a bigger pasture or field for all of that to unfold. And the answer is, of course, any human being can do this. And after 35 years of MBSR at the UMass Medical Center, uh, training you know, upwards of more than 20,000 medical patients referred by their physicians and coming to the clinic by themselves uh, for every conceivable uh, ailment and discomfort and stress and chronic pain, that we can say that this is a kind of something that anybody can do if they have the motivation to do it. You have to really have a strong motivation to befriend yourself in some way. And this is a, a radical act, not only of love, but of befriending. You know, take your seat and step outside of time into the present moment. So it's no longer, you know, how long am I going to sit, but just can I be here for, say, one breath? coming in and one breath going out. And that is without pushing or pulling the breath, and let's not make it artificial in any way, shape, or form, but just can I f ride the waves of one in-breath and one out-breath with full awareness? And I can experiment with my eyes open, with my eyes closed. It doesn't really matter because the awareness is the awareness. Can I give myself over in a certain way to awareness itself? And so we can experiment. So what is your experience right in this moment? Can you be aware of the body sitting here breathing? Really a sense of the body as a whole. In other words, grounded on your seat or cushion. You can sit in any number of different configurations. But rooted in a certain way to the, in the posture that you're in so that the spine elevates out of the pelvis and everything is kind of grounded and then also elevating, lofty. And the head is balanced on the neck and shoulders. We're doing something comfortable with the hands. And we're just here. And we have no agenda other than to be awake, to be here. And of course, whether you've been practicing for 50 years or whether you just, you know, this is your first encounter with anything having to do with meditation, it doesn't take long to discover that the mind totally has a life of its own and it will just go here and there and it doesn't necessarily even want to be sitting and exploring as if this were a laboratory uh, 
the present moment. Who cares about the present moment? I got work to do. I got things to do. I got places to go. And of course, even if you don't, your mind is going to go everywhere conceivable because that's what the mind does. It just conceives of one thing after another after another. And you can get carried away in this thought train or that thought chain. And then some of the thoughts have heavy duty emotions associated with them. A lot of them often difficult and stressful and problematic or bringing up all sorts of strong feelings. And others, you know, very light and spacious and wonderful, but easily leading into fantasy and, you know, sort of getting caught up in the future or in the past, uh, how things were greater, so good in the, in the past, but they're not so good now, or how they were horrible, and that explains why I'm not feeling so well now. And, and of course, the present moment's gone. But look, here we are. Your body's still here. If you haven't shut down this webinar, you're still here. I'm still here. So, and it's now this moment of now. It's not the other one when your mind was wandering. So no problem. You don't have to suppress anything, deny anything, reject anything. Just right back to now. And this, say, moment of whatever is unfolding. So you can begin to shape your experience of uh, thoughts and emotions as kind of like weather patterns in the mind. Sometimes very stormy. When we are, you know, angry or frightened or just stressed and uncomfortable or sad. You know, like storms in the mind. And we don't have to take it personally. It's just like weather patterns. If you're a mountain sitting, the mountain doesn't care whether it's like a tremendous storm or totally sunny and beautiful. So sometimes we suggest, you know, when you take your seat, sit with the strength and unmoving massiveness of a, of a mountain. Just that attitude that you're here in the middle of your life and in this moment you're just here. And you don't have to do anything, get anywhere, or understand anything, have any special insights or you know, great experiences. It's just this experience is about as great as it can be because guess what? You're alive for it. That's pretty profound. If your liver's not complaining and your heart's not complaining and your lungs aren't complaining and your brain is actually functioning and your eyes work and your ears work, you know, I mean, the scale is weighted towards favorability that there's a lot right with you, much more right with you than what's wrong with you. But when the mind gets caught up in its own little twists and turns, then very often we only feature what's wrong, what's weighing on us, how messed up we are, all of that kind of stuff. And you can be free of it in this moment by just seeing it as clouds passing in the sky. And you don't take it personally. And the awareness is the sky. So it can, it's big enough to hold it all and it doesn't, it's just like space. And that space is awake. It's knowing. It, it is cognizant. It can recognize what's unfolding and patterns in the unfolding and sometimes patterns you've never seen before in your own mind or in your own body insights all of a sudden you see something's been there for 20 years you know now you see oh this is connected to that when I want things to be a certain way and it doesn't happen that way then I you know sort of react in this kind of a way and fall into this kind of emotional pattern and I've been doing it for years, and it keeps getting me into trouble, and, and it's like stuck. But then when you see it, all of a sudden, right in this moment, you're not stuck. And you increase the potential for when that actually does happen in your life. You'll catch it. You'll see it, and you'll come like a fork in the road. And you decide, this is the way I've always gone in terms of this like, stress reactivity of one kind or another, and I just always go down that road, and I know that that road is going to create more suffering. I'm going to try the new road. Just non-doing. I won't, I won't, I don't have to solve any problems. I'll just not go there and I'll just be here. If I don't know what to do, not, not doing anything is an option. I mean, it's a, it's a form of doing. 
And then maybe at a certain point, if I don't go the old route, which is going to trap me in some way or other, then something will arise. I'll know what to do. And to have faith, confidence, deep confidence that um, you're okay and that if something doesn't come to you now, it may will come to you in time if you don't continually beat yourself up. So here we are once again, the present moment. Now, although the liver may be fine and the heart may be fine, the longer you sit, especially if you're cross-legged on the floor, then may, maybe your back is going to hurt a little bit or your knees will hurt a little bit. That's not a problem. You can investigate discomfort. And notice how quick the mind is to call it pain. And the mind gets inflamed much faster than your joints. And then you build some big story of like, this is killing me. I can't stand it. My back is going to be ruined. You know, with but it's actually just sensation in the body. Can we befriend sensation in the body? When you get up, all, of this, all these sensations are going to disappear, these unpleasant sensations. But don't notice when the mind wants to make it into pain. Because as soon as you make it into pain, more intensity, more story, more narrative about my back and what a mess it is, or this, that, or the other, or this meditation stupid because who wants to be in discomfort? Well, meditation didn't invent discomfort. You know, it's part of the human condition. So this whole thing is a challenge. How are we going to be in relationship to the human condition, to this being human, to this breath moving in and out of the body, to the thoughts and emotions moving through the mind, to a sense of the body as a whole, sitting, standing, lying down, moving, running, making love, chopping vegetables, eating, can you see that the invitation is to allow or notice that our awareness could hold, can hold anything and everything? Anything and everything. So when we take our seat and I say this is actually a love affair with life, I'm not joking and I'm not speaking of it metaphorically. It's like something that eventually you may come to feel like this is like a, a pit stop. You know, refueling, recharging your batteries, or remembering, reconnecting with who you really are before you take it back out on the road and run around getting things done. And maybe, actually, if you really want to get things done, good things and so forth, and continually check things off your never-ending to-do list, maybe the way to do that is to let the doing come out of your being, come out of this spaciousness that's already equanimous, it's already balanced, it's a mind and body are in some sense more balanced when we're coming out of being and out of this timeless quality of the present moment. And then we may decide that some things on our to-do list we don't need to do. We may be able to differentiate what's urgent and drives us crazy from what's important and never gets done because we're always dealing with the urgent. That's another form of wisdom to navigate your life, to make choices, to go with the ups and downs and the ins and the outs, and as Homer says in the Odyssey, the twists and turns, you know, of life that sometimes bring us to very, very difficult, unwanted moments that no one would wish on you and that you certainly wouldn't have chosen, and yet that's life, you know. It's, as Zorba the Greek called it, the full catastrophe of the human condition. But that's not a problem. That's part of the sea that we swim in, but it's not the whole sea. There's also the full catastrophe includes the beauty, the insane beauty of being alive, the insane beauty of being in relationship with our parents, our children, our friends, our grandchildren, uh, lovers, uh, the air, the light, uh, vegetation, the earth, the water, seas. I mean, there's so much beauty in this world. And that's even before you go into the museums or to the concert halls or whatever. So it's like not one, not the other, but can we hold the full dimensionality of our lives and maybe even discover or uncover what some of those maybe dimensions that have been hidden to us in our own lives actually offer? 
they're available. So we're, in some sense, as we cultivate mindfulness, discovering hidden dimensions of possibility. And that means that we're not caught in our own highly conditioned patterns of behavior unless we want to be. We have the opportunity in any moment just kind of recognize how caught we are or how mindless we are, and then we're free in that moment, in this moment. And it's always this moment, not that moment. And I might say that when you cultivate mindfulness, I mean, the first thing you become aware of actually is how mindless we tend to be. So, you know, you close your eyes and think, okay, I get what John's saying. <clears throat> I'm just going to be totally still, totally calm, and just let it all pass like a play of, you know, light on a, you know, like a movie, like a play of light on, on a wall. And yet, very, very quickly, you'll get caught up in the play. You'll think you're in a movie rather than just, you know, something projected on a wall. And that's okay, too, because in the next moment you'll recognize that you're back in the domain of being, in the domain of wakefulness. So this is a very forgiving practice. I mean, it will, you know, if you, if you tend to cultivate it and stay with it, over time, um, it's deeply nurturing. It allows us to actually live our lives as if they really mattered, and to not fight with reality, and to not get caught in narratives that say, this shouldn't have happened when it already did, because that's how we fight with reality. It happened. You didn't want it to happen? True. You want now to solve the problem so that you get out of it in the best possible way? True. But right in this moment, it's just what it is. As soon as you adopt that kind of perspective, you have more ways of dealing with the it than when you are reacting and caught up in trying to escape or trying to pursue. So escape from what you don't like, pursue what you want as an outcome, and you're just always off balance. Running, pushing away what you don't like, the aversive, the unwanted, that may be here right now, and grasping for what you do want and clinging to it and this is like you can see in my body. It's like off. It's off. And what we're doing is gathering those energies and just saying, okay, I don't know what's going to unfold in the next moment. Can I be here for this one with the full catastrophe of whatever it is in this moment? And this is, as I said, it's kind of a laboratory. And the more you come to it with that open-hearted spaciousness and as a radical act of love just to take your seat, the more you realize it's also a radical act of sanity to cultivate some being rather than just continual doing. A radical act of sanity and a radical act of recognition of how inter-embedded and interconnected we are with each other, with nature, with the world, and with the human heart. So you might ask if you're watching this, well, what happened to the meditation? What happened to the silence? Are we still meditating or is he talking? I don't know. It, de it depends on how we're in relationship to it. If you are experiencing your body in this moment, taking in what it is that I'm saying as I wag my tongue in concert with moving my lips and my vocal cords and somehow magically sending out vibrations in the airwaves that through all sorts of electronic magic are coming to your ears. I mean, that's a total miracle in the first place. But can we hold the whole thing in awareness? And then, you know, this is meditation too. It's not like, oh, would you please shut up and then I can meditate? Yeah, if you want silence, great. Shut it off. Just be. I've said enough. You don't need to hear anymore. Believe me. But at the same time, can you see that we haven't left the domain of awareness at all? You can be mindful of what I'm saying, mindful of how this is affecting you one way or the other, liking it, disliking it, agreeing with it, 
making arguments in your mind and so forth. But the fact of the matter is, we're meditating as much now as if I were to just stop, close my mouth, and we just sit here. It's the same awareness. It's the same awareness. So we can learn to, if we can learn to inhabit this awareness, to make this in some sense the default mode rather than the kind of narrative stories we're continually uh, generating in the mind about how we're doing and where we're going and how things are going to work out or how they're not going to work out and what I have still on my to-do list before I fall into bed exhausted, then maybe this is a process of completely reclaiming our lives in the only moment, again, I sound like a broken record, if you know what a record is, but uh, reclaiming our lives in the sense that if you check your watch, you know, my God, it's now again. Holy smoke. Every time. It's like, what time is it? It's now. And it's very precious not to be missed because if you miss it, you're missing this moment of life. And you only get so many breaths and then you exit. Many people have said very eloquent things about that, like Shakespeare. All of life is a stage, you know, and it has its exits and its entrances. So right now we're, as Dante said, you know, someplace in the middle of this road we call our life. So are we here for it or are we on our way to some better moment some other time when all the things that we want to happen happen and all the things we don't want to happen somehow magically are kept in abeyance? So that's an ongoing choice of all of us, moment by moment. And when we live in this way, when we give ourselves over in this way, formal practice, then that's uh, one element of the cultivation of mindfulness in everyday life. It's not the only one because then, no matter how long we sit, sooner or later we have to get up and do something else. And by the way, it's not just sitting. We have lying down practices, formal meditation practices, lying down, body scans of various lengths and descriptions and also different kinds of lying down meditations, walking meditations, sitting meditations, standing meditation, running meditations, all sorts of formal meditation practices. But then we have informal meditation practice, which basically is the rest of your life. Everything can become part of your meditation practice if you're here for it. Why not be awake and aware when you're driving? Probably a good idea. Why not be awake and aware and in touch at work with what's going on in your mind, with, with what's going on in the office, in other people's minds, or wherever it is that you work? Can you be in touch with the f larger field of all of us together, not just me as the center of the universe? And that's kind of an invitation and an ongoing experiment. And when we bring the formal practice and the informal practice together in our lives on a regular daily basis, again, this becomes like a profound love affair. And you would no sooner want to miss that time of formal practice in your life then you would want to miss brushing your teeth, for instance. Simply because it doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel good. It's like a certain kind of self-care and a certain kind of recalibration that you're actually rebooting, to use a computer term. You're, you're kind of rebooting yourself, reminding yourself, rebodying yourself so that you can be maximally available to the world and the world can be maximally available to you. And then, what do you do with that? That's where the creativity, the imagination, the freedom comes in. Yeah, whatever you are impelled to do that seems wisest or that is most beneficial to others. When you're not taking yourself so personally, you realize that in an interconnected universe, being completely preoccupied with yourself is a form of violence to others and to yourself. And so we gradually begin to see, not learn or memorize some kind of philosophy, but just see that uh, 
who we think we are and who we actually are are very different. And the narrative of who we think we are spends, takes over an enormous amount of time and energy in our lives and in our heads. And the irony is that we're much bigger than who we think we are. No matter how big we think we are or how diminished and small we think we are, it's like, it's just thinking. It's not the actuality of it at all. So if you take any of this to heart, then you can embrace yourself in a way that embodies dignity, respect, loving kindness, self-compassion, and then there's really no boundary. The skin is not the boundary of who you are. And we are in this ongoing relation, relationality with life, all life, and with the planet, and with the air, and the light, and the, you know, the earth, and the environment. And, and when we know something about that inwardly, not just merely through thinking, but through embodied living, then we'll take better care of the planet. And we'll act when we need to act with wisdom to you know, guide how things are going, not just for me, myself, and my optimizing my benefits, uh, my salary, or my, you know, health, or my anything, but realize that you can't be healthy in an unhealthy world. You can't be, you know, maximizing profits in a world where people are being destroyed by, you know, greed. So these are, you know, sort of profound ways in which we can cultivate what's deepest and best in us as human beings. Now I'll say a few more things about mindfulness. Um, in all Asian languages, the word for mind and the word for heart are the same word. So when you hear the word mindfulness in English, if you're not hearing the word heartfulness simultaneously or feeling it, then you're not really understanding it. This is not some cold clinical microscope peering kind of uh, bringing things into focus. This is recognizing the emotional valence of everything, of the interconnectedness of things. Why? Because that's what's most fundamental. The interconnectedness is the way the universe is. It's interconnected. So from that point of view, uh, the natural impulse when we take our seats in this kind of gesture of this radical gesture or act of love or self-compassion or wakefulness or um, sanity is to be more inclusive, to be more spacious, and the love just is part of it. The compassion naturally arises, the caring for others, the impulse to want to help others hold their suffering or to even recognize, be recognized as having it because sometimes you can't do anything about it, but you can be here with the other. And so compassion is, and, and kindness are completely enmeshed and woven into the nature of mindfulness from the very beginning. And that's another way of expressing how deep a love affair this can be. So if any of this makes any sense to you, again, whether this is the first time you've ever heard the word mindfulness or thought about a formal meditation practice, or whether you are an MBSR teacher who have been practicing for days, weeks, months, years, decades, a lifetime, in my own life I find that um, I'm wanting to sit more not just on retreats when I go away for long periods of time and just do this, say, 18 hours a day, sitting and walking in silence for the most part. But um, whenever I see my cushion, I put cushions in different parts of my house, and when I see it, I try to get my butt on the cushion, just impulsively, even if I'm going into another room. It kind of reminds me, oh, let me take five minutes and just recalibrate, or drop, or open, or 10 minutes. And if you wake up in the morning, since this is all about waking up, why not take your seat? Why not come to take your seat? And again, I mean that in a very big way, so it could be 
lying down, any kind of formal meditation practice, but why not start the day by tuning your instrument in this way? Why not? Every day, as if your life depended on it. And it does, it does. Hopefully, from what I've been saying, you, you sense that. Your life depends on it in more ways than you think, even. And I like to say in more ways than you can think, because thinking is a kind of limited affair in many ways. Einstein you know, said, if you're lucky if you have one or two good thoughts in a whole lifetime. Most of our thoughts are you know, pretty pathetic, but we're so attached to them when we recognize them as thoughts at all, because a lot of time we just don't know that we're thinking. We just think that it's the truth that, well, of whatever it is that we like or don't like or want or don't want. You know, we, just, we don't know that those are all thoughts. We just think it's the truth of things, and then that's how you put nails in your coffin. It's as simple as that. So uh, to close, I'd just like to encourage you to Take a deep look at how you are in relationship to your meditation practice, if you have one, or if you are drawn to a, maybe even thinking about having a practice. And just see whether there's the potential for renewal, for deepening, for sharpening the focus, for opening the heartfulness. So this is not about time. It's not about, oh, I have to sit for a half hour or 45 minutes or do my body scan for 45 minutes. What about 45 seconds? What about, what about no time at all? So I want to thank you for listening. This is the first uh, webinar and maybe the last that I will ever do in my life, uh, but I got roped into doing it, and I hope that it's of some use out there in the world. Um, if you um, have anything to say about it, um, you can tweet the Center for Mindfulness or uh, go on their Facebook page. Uh, I'm a little bit harder to find, uh, but uh, in some way or other, recognize that you're joining or, or have been long a part of a global community of people who enact this way of being, this gesture of sanity, this commitment to living life as if it really mattered and fully on a global scale that's influencing now economics and politics, health care, education, parenting. There's really no end to the benefits and the domains in which uh, which can benefit from greater present moment, non-reactive, non-judgmental, open-hearted presence. Not too many, aside from maybe deep sleep. So um, I feel tremendous gratitude to have this opportunity to connect in this way through the web with you, whoever you are, wherever you are. And uh, it's not so much about communicating me to you or you to me, but but really being attuned to the people we are connected with in intimate ways, in deep ways, at work, at home, and family, and so forth, and taking every opportunity to recognize how precious these moments are, and how fleeting, and how quickly it's gone, all of it. and following your heart in whatever way makes sense to you. So wishing you all the best, and perhaps at some point in one way or another, through books, through guided meditations, through meeting in person, we will meet each other. But again, the most important thing is that you recognize that you are part of what we sometimes call this Indra's net or Indra's network, an old ancient uh, image but that involves uh, interconnectedness with the entire world and every human creature and every other creature in it. And, and maybe we'll even take responsibility for that. I don't know. Wishing you well.